Welcome everyone to our very first live stream event. So my name is Sasha and I'm a PhD student here in Cape Town, South Africa. And we are here tonight to present to you our very first short film, The Sound of Hope. So the film was produced in collaboration with Homebrew Films and Sea Search Research and Conservation. And it showcases our current acoustic research on humpback dolphins here in South Africa. So this is a really special project that myself and the rest of the team have spent most of last year working on. And we are really proud to present it to everyone tonight. So please stay tuned as well for after the film, where we have pulled together members from Sea Search plus scientists from around South Africa for an expert panel where we will be chatting a little bit more about humpback dolphins in our waters and answering all of the questions that you may have after the film. So please be aware that this section will also be recorded and it'll be uploaded after tonight for everyone to watch um, after this live event. So without further ado, please let's play the film. Two spectacular and contrasting oceans surround the southern part of Africa. The Atlantic side of the continent is a showcase of a cold marine environment with an impressive abundance of life on islands and below the surface. This is the realm of the Benguela Current. By contrast, on the Indian Ocean side of the African continent, the water is warmer, generating a diverse and colourful marine environment. This is the realm of the Agulhas Current. These two oceans surrounding Southern Africa, plus the effects of the Southern Oceans, create a diverse and unique marine region with nearly 40 species of marine mammals. The coastal area around the city of Cape Town is a microcosm of the mixing zone between these two oceans and holds a remarkable level of marine biodiversity. Here, five species of dolphins and three species of baleen whale are regularly observed from shore. Ranging from Cape Town up the warm eastern coast, there lives a unique marine mammal. A shy and rare dolphin that still remains an enigma for researchers. This is the Indian Ocean humpback dolphin, the most endangered marine mammal in South Africa. There are in total four species of humpback dolphins in the world, and all of them live in very shallow coastal waters. The Indian Ocean humpback dolphin is an inshore species that hug the coast along the warm waters from India to Cape Town, avoiding completely the cold Atlantic Ocean. Despite many years of research, not much is known about this unique dolphin in South African waters. Although the best estimates available suggest that there are no more than 500 individuals along the entire coast, down from around 1,000 individuals only 20 years ago. Their habitat and habits make them hard to study. They move and socialise in small groups, often hiding in the surf zone, and in murky water making them difficult to find and photograph. Individuals are known to move along hundreds of kilometres of coastline and are rarely identified more than a few times in any study. This makes it almost impossible for scientists to study important individual level questions like health, survival and calving rate. The Indian Ocean humpback dolphin's preference for coastal shallow waters places them in some of the most dangerous waters. Coastal shallow seas are most intensely utilised by humans and dolphins encounter waters with heavy fishing, shipping, recreational activities and pollution entering the seas from rivers and beaches. 
This dolphin faces some serious threats, as nearly 20% of the South African coast has some form of development within 100 metres of the shoreline. Since humpback dolphins depend on and prefer coastal zones associated with rivers and estuaries, they have amongst the highest level of pollutant of any marine mammal in South Africa. Another serious threat is the devastating effect of shark nets that kills far too many humpback dolphins per year in KwaZulu-Natal, removing valuable individuals from an already endangered dolphin population. Humpback dolphins may also struggle to find enough food. Marine scientists suggest that the decline in reef fish species and the over-exploitation of many estuarine-dependent fish species may limit the growth of this dolphin population. It is very difficult to assess the impacts of all these natural and human-induced threats on the declining numbers of the humpback dolphin. It is likely that the collective pressures of all these threats are the driving factor contributing to the fast decline of humpback dolphin population. These threats are associated not only with a clear drop in dolphin numbers, but also changes in their natural behaviour and the increase in the number of solitary animals. The further development of South Africa's ocean economy will increase pressure on the humpback dolphin that could finally drive this unique marine mammal to extinction. To conservationists and marine scientists, it was clear that something urgently needed to be done to avoid losing this enigmatic dolphin from our coastal waters. Working with such low numbers of humpback dolphins, the researchers needed to innovate to obtain better data. So as a response to these threats, researchers around South Africa came together and formed the SUSE Consortium in May 2016. And this was the, with the aim to increase research capacity in humpback dolphins around South Africa. So this award-winning consortium comprises of 18 members from 15 different institutions and they come together to conserve the species at a national level in South Africa. So when we're working with such low numbers in a population, it's really important that we now need to innovate to come up with new ideas for better ways to study these animals. Humpback dolphins rely heavily on vocal channels for communication and exploration of their environment. The use of acoustic monitoring offers a cost-effective option for detecting animals along the coast, particularly in water with low visibility, such as estuaries and sheltered bays. A key area of my research has been trying to confirm signature whistle use in these animals. Dolphins are unique among mammals in having signature whistles, which are similar to a name and are used to communicate with one another. All previous efforts at acoustically monitoring dolphins have only identified vocalisations to the species level of present or absent. This study is a new approach and will allow researchers to identify individual dolphins and look at numbers, movements and even who's hanging out with who. The research team will be deploying underwater recording units throughout South Africa to detect dolphin presence. This unique and exciting new way to collect data on humpback dolphins will mean scientists are able to monitor this endangered species with very little or no interference. Also eliminating the need to be on the water and directly interacting with individuals that may influence their natural behaviour. By identifying naturally occurring vocalisations, scientists will be able not only to locate the animals along the coast, but also determine how far they travel and also estimate the number of individuals in the group. By recording humpback dolphin vocalisations, scientists will be able to explore habitats that are remote or difficult to access via boat. Instead of being limited to studying them on a few good weather days, scientists will be able to record information about the animal's movements 24 hours a day and over extended periods giving superb and more comprehensive information of the dolphin's activities. The use of underwater acoustic technology will open a new world on the secret life of the enigmatic humpback dolphin. Not a moment too soon, as this information will be vital to better understand 
and conserve South Africa's most endangered marine mammal. Welcome back everyone. <laughs> I hope you really enjoyed the film. Thank you all for joining in with the discussion this evening. So hopefully over the next 20 minutes or so, or a little bit longer maybe, we can hopefully shed, shed some light on our research, the acoustic work that we're doing. But mainly we really want to share with you some more information about humpback dolphin conservation here, right here in South Africa. So if you do have any questions, now is your chance to pop them in the chat box to the side of your screen. You will have to log into YouTube maybe or, or Google. And then when you do post them in there, Courtney, who is working in behind the scenes tonight to help us, she will be managing the show backstage and she'll be able to pop them up on our screen. And we will try our best to answer um, any and every question that you have. So first of all, let me introduce my amazing panel for this evening. Um, so um, first of all, we have um, myself, I'm a PhD candidate, um, from Stellenbosch University and Sea Search here in Cape Town. I'm also the PhD candidate on the SWORD project, which is the project behind the research in the film tonight. And then we have Dr. Tess Gridley. So Dr. Tess Gridley, she is a co-director of Sea Search Research and Conservation and a postdoc at Stellenbosch University and honorary research associate at the University of Cape Town, also currently based in Cape Town, and she is the principal investigator of the SWORD research project. <laughs> uh, Thanks, hello, Tess. <laughs> Evening. Um, next, we have Dr. Simon Elwin. So Dr. Simon Elwin is also a co-director of Sea Search. He's a research associate at Stellenbosch University, Cape Town, and he is also a SWORD principal investigator. Hello, Simon. Hi, everyone. Uh, then we have Dr. Gwen Penry with us this evening. So Gwen is a research associate at the Institute for Coastal and Marine Research at Nelson Mandela University. She is our Brutus Whale Guru. She's currently based in Plettenberg Bay and she is a SUSE Consortium core member and a PI on the Sustainable Marine Tourism Project. Hello, Gwen. Um, and then we have Shannon Atkins from Vitz University and the Endangered Wildlife Trust in Richards Bay. And she's currently based in KwaZulu-Natal and she's also a core consortium member. Hi, Sasha. Hello, hello. And then we have Dr. Stephanie Plone and Stephanie is affiliated with the Bay World Center for Research and Education. She is currently based in Port Elizabeth and is also a core member of the SUSE Consortium. Hi guys. Hello, hello. Um, so, um, to start things off, I think it would be really good to chat about the, the thing that links us all together um, here this evening, which is the SUSE Consortium. So everyone here on the panel is a member of the SUSE Consortium and has been a core member for the last few years. Um, so I'm going to throw it to Simon. Maybe do you want to talk about a bit more about the consortium um, and what it's been up to over the last few years? Yeah, thanks, Sasha. Um, the SUSE consortium uh, is not a unique, uh, it's not a unique gathering, but it certainly uh, has, has broken a bit of ground uh, in terms of cetacean conservation. It's something that really stemmed out of uh, work that, that's been happening over the last uh, 10 or 20 years. There have been a lot of individual research projects on humpback dolphins. Uh, people did a study in Mosse Bay or a study in Plettenberg Bay. And when I had a student, Bridget James, working on uh, data in Mosse Bay, what we realized was that we couldn't put all these bits of information together. Um, and that was, you know, we, we all started talking as, as different researchers in the country uh, that we're getting together doing African Marine Mammal Research, uh, African Marine Mammal Colloquium, 
And we, we really realized that we, we needed to sort of think more cooperatively uh, and start being more clear in, and forward-looking in, um, in, in our research going forward. And that's sort of one of really where, where the um, SUSE, SUSE sort of consortium built out of was this network of different researchers who were all kind of doing our own thing. But it was really, really stepped up when we had Elsa Mullen, who, who came as a postdoc in our group. And she put the time and effort into really getting everybody to work together and coordinate our data. And we managed to produce a useful paper out of that, um, which, which helped um, really look at movements between these populations and, and provide a, the first estimate of numbers, even though it wasn't a great estimate because we, we couldn't really do it. But it really highlighted how important it was for everybody to be working together collaboratively. And so Al's did an excellent job of I'm really formulating the consortium and sort of guidelines on how we all work together. And it's, it's been uh, fairly productive, um, I think, in, in, in the sense of what we've achieved and what, what research is, is happening going forward. Um, and it makes a big difference having everybody essentially on the same page and knowing what other research teams are, are getting up to. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. Um, so I think that gives a really good base for um, our backgrounds and how we've all come together to work with humpback dolphins um, for their conservation in South Africa. Um, so we do have Courtney who is behind the scenes tonight and she is monitoring your questions over on YouTube. So Courtney, do you want to send over the first question for the, for the team here? So Retailing Africa, um, Romy, who is nine from Fishhook down here in Cape Town, want to know why they have humps. So do they have humps like a camel, guys? Or what sort of humps do they have? Who wants to uh, take on <laughs> <Okay. Romy? laughs> This is your Steph. Yes. I'm giving it to Steph. This is you all over. <laughs> yeah, Steph. I think that's a very good question, Romy. We certainly have, have um, wondered about that for years and years. And um, we had the opportunity a few years ago um, to get a few hums from the unfortunate animals that get entangled in the shark nets of KwaZulu Natal. And we've put them through, a, um, I guess, like a CT scanner, right, that people use in medical research to find out um, where the blood vessels are, are they different from bottlenose dolphins, and what's in the rest of the hump. And essentially what we found is that it's mainly connective tissue, so it's really... There's a nice picture of it, a really dense, hard tissue. It's not floppy at all. It's quite um, solid. And the blood vessels are slightly different to the bottlenose dolphin. And I think that's got to do with the inshore environment. Um, uh, these, these animals are living 500 meters from shore, so and they don't travel much like the oceanic dolphins do. They don't use mu much muscle energy. And we think this hump is being used as an area for regulating body temperature because these blood vessels um, help regulate the body temperature in in the um, in the animal. So if it's it can if it's in cold water or warm water, it can kind of regulate the blood flow through the hump um, in in that sense. And does the, does the hump vary in size as well between different species and animals? Um, I noticed that that's a different way to ID the animals that we've seen from the boat. It's not just the dorsal fin, but from the shape of the hump as well. Yeah, but there hasn't been a study between... We only we only examined two or three humps. So to to examine the variation in the in the size and shape of the hump, you need a larger sample. And to compare to other Sousa species in the genus, definitely that would be an interesting thing to do. Yeah. Next study. <laughs> <laughs> There's always more to study, definitely. Um, so what Mr. Courtney, have you got another question for our panel here? So um Ayaka is oh god of the story. I marked that one up. Ayaka Azturk said, is it genetically isolated population that you're working on? Um, so the population that we're working on here in South Africa, um, I, who do you think can answer that question? Maybe Tessa Simon, the one that we're working on here in the, the South Coast. 
I'm, go I'm going to throw that to Simon and, and Stephanie um, as, um, yeah, I think that's the probably best place to answer that. Uh, sure, let me, let me just say, uh, so humpback dolphins tend to form, naturally form fairly small semi-isolated populations. So along South Africa, we have a population, this is what came out of the photographic work that we did a few years back. We know that essentially the animals between, looking at the map on the screen, between about Cape Town and just east of Port Elizabeth are one population. Then there's a bit of a gap and um, there's a separate population on the north coast, north part of the Kwajalein Natal coast. What we know about the genetics in South Africa is almost all based on animals from that KwaZulu Natal population. There have been a number of studies globally that have shown there's very clear um, separation of populations. It, it depends on how, how detailed you look, uh, but there's certainly separation of populations. What we don't yet know is, is how there's, that this population we're dealing with on the south coast, how isolated they are in terms of uh, literal sort of day-to-day -day movements of individuals. Um, and also genetically, because we only have a handful of samples from animals actually on the south coast, because they, they strand incredibly rarely. Um, and uh, I think Stephanie's got a, done a, been involved in a lot of the work that's come out of the Kwazulu Natal population. Um, but as yet, there's been no genetic work done on the south coast population. Um, I don't know, Stephanie, do you have any further comments there? No, I think that's that's it in a nutshell. We've just um, we're just busy using some. Um, samples from mainly from the tail, um, but also go back quite a few decades. So the the availability of teeth in the museum collection in Port Elizabeth allowed us to use that as a as a way of extracting DNA and looking at genetic changes over time as well. So that's what we're just busy with. Yeah, I think. Um the lack of samples was something that was surprised me working with humpback dolphins, the lack of uh, strandings data as well, comparison to other species of dolphin. Um, so John Crockett has a question. What recording technology are you using and how are you deploying them, especially in the shallow surf zone? So Tess, I think this is a question down our street with um, dealing with the shallow surf zone, because that's something that we've been struggling with or dealing with for a long time now. Yeah, cheers. Um, it's a good question. Oh, that's how he does. Um, okay, so in general, we, we conduct the acoustic research in, in different ways. So we do focal follow. So effectively, we go out on t uh, uh, to sea on a small boat, and we basically follow groups of dolphins around, and we record the sounds that they make using... Um, uh, it's called a hydrophone. It's an underwater microphone, effectively. And, and when we do that, um, we're really trying to get um, detailed information on the behavior of the animals um, and to really record if they are making these signature whistle calls to, to record those and catalog them. In terms of the long-term data that we're collecting, we um, are using um, recording instruments called sand trap hydrophones. Uh, they're made by a company called Ocean Instruments. And the benefit of these sand traps, and I, I don't have one to hand, I don't know, Courtney, if we have an image of one, um, but they're around th this size um, and they record um, for, for several weeks at a time. Um, and dependent on the settings that you use, you can set them to um, record the very high frequency, there we go, um, sound uh, produced by dolphins and in fact um, over 200 kilohertz we can record up to. Um, the, the issue with sound trap hydrophones unfortunately for people working in Africa is that they're very expensive so um, they're several thousand US dollars per unit and that means that we're quite restricted in terms of the number of, um, of these hydrophones that we can actually um, deploy and put out into the environment. And so currently we're looking into other options and there's, um, there's a great uh, company working in the UK who makes something called an audio moth um, and these are very um, small and fairly low cost in um, comparison to the sound traps. And so we're currently doing quite a lot of testing to, to use these audio moths which have mostly been used um, to record bats and birds and other animals in the terrestrial realm. We're trying to now use these audio moths um, underwater um, and record dolphins with them. So um, we've been out and we've recorded common dolphins, we've recorded the killer whale that's recently been in False Bay um, and, and several other dolphin species using these, these small audio moths, which I don't know if we've got an image, but I've got one here. They're about this large. 
Um, and they come in at about 2,000 rand, so about um, 100 US dollars per unit, so quite a lot uh, less in the sand traps. Um, so we're testing those out currently um, and to see whether we can use them in this project um, with humpback dolphins. Um, so, Rotendo Kruger. Um, hi, my name is Yara. I am 10 years old. Hi, Yara. Um, and I want to know if global warming also affects dolphins. Um, we didn't mention it. Is it because the other issues are far greater? Yara, that is an awesome, awesome question. Um, and we did mention several threats in the video, and I didn't mention climate change as being one of them. Um, does somebody want to discuss the, the threats to the dolphins in South Africa a little bit more and why climate change is not necessarily um, one of the main threats listed against humpback dolphins. I'm going to give that to Shannon and Gwen. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking over to you guys. I think we can all... Yeah, I, look, I think we can all chip in here, but <clears throat> climate change feeds into all of the threats, really. It's an overarching problem that um, habitat shifts and changes and uh, shifts in their prey availability will all be increased by um, or exacerbated by climate change. Um, and also because of their, their very coastal distribution, you know, increased storm surges and um, yeah, just so climate change will affect them, um, but we, as a consortium, we're trying to focus on on some of the threats that we can action sort of immediately and, and deal with one at a time. Um, and hopefully that, by doing that, we'll be able to mitigate against the long-term threats um, of climate change. Go Shannon, your turn. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I was just thinking about, it's, quite up the other way around for me because there didn't used to be humpback dolphins as far down as False Bay. I remember that Ken Finley published work that seemed like they may have been extending their range and perhaps that has something to do with climate change or maybe it doesn't. But um, yeah, that was what I was thinking. They might, may have had a range extension because of it might be one positive. Shannon, can you good. maybe... Not good. Could you maybe elaborate on some of the issues that you've seen with the shark nets um, from your studies in Richard Bay? The shark nets? Mm. Yeah. I mean, as a threat, shark, yeah. As a threat, the shark nets are there and Guazulu Natal people, her, well, Sharks Board has put them out there to protect bathers and humpback dolphins are one of the species that is caught unintentionally. Nobody wants to catch them, but they are like collateral damage and people are working hard sharks board is aware of the problem and we're working with them to do things to try and mitigate this um we've tried things like pingers which are acoustic warning devices they we set them in the nets and they go ping 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 and we hope that that would warn the dolphins and keep them away but that didn't work like we'd like it to have and stephanie's published some work around bottlenose dolphins and pingers. With the humpback dolphins, the actual numbers of dolphins that are caught in the net is so small that it, you don't get a good scientific study and statistically significant results because um, there are so few of them. Um, but what we have found that has worked is to replace some of the nets with baited hooks. So dolphins don't get caught on the baited hooks and over the past few years, we are seeing fewer dolphins caught in those nets because there are fewer nets. And I think one of the nets has actually also been removed, has it not, Shannon? Yeah, so work that we did, we looked at where in the where in Guazulu Natal the dolphins are caught. And for humpback dolphins, 60% of the humpback dolphins that were caught in KwaZulu Natal were caught at Richards Bay, which is one of 37 installations. So we knew to focus there. And then within the installation, which had seven nets when we started, um, we looked and we saw that definitely this one net was catching more dolphins than any other. <coughs> Excuse me. And we worked with the Sharks Board and they made that net smaller and replaced it with baited hooks. And that reduced the number of dolphins 
from an average of four a year to an average of three, which doesn't sound like a lot, but is significant. And that happened in 2005. So every year we congratulate ourselves for having saved another humpback dolphin. <laughs> and um, in 2019, the other net that was catching a lot of dolphins, we managed to get rid of that one too. So now we've clocked up another two dolphins that haven't died. <laughs> so that's the, the main thing that we've been doing to mitigate against that particular threat. But dolphins still die. We do still need to work on it. We are looking at it as more a so <coughs> social ecological issue now, not just focusing on the dolphins, but talking to the stakeholders and the people who are involved with setting the nets and permitting the nets and funding the program and just trying to understand how the whole system works so that we can figure out how to change it. No, yeah, awesome. I think it's an awesome um, success story in the con hum conservation of humpback dolphins in South Africa. So yeah, well done for the work that you've been doing there over many, many years. Um, Courtney, do we have another question? So Marine Finn says, hi guys, what is the conservation status of humpback dolphins? And what is the current projects on cetaceans in South Africa and Namibia? Thanks and apologies if the questions have already been answered. Woof, Marine Finn, that is a, a, a wide uh, open-ended question. Um, so current um, conservation status in South Africa is um, endangered. So they are locally um, endangered on the IACN red list um, and they are an endangered species worldwide as well. Um, and then current, I think the second part of that question was conservation projects. So the consortium is involved in many of those. So does somebody want to, to delve into a little bit more about those, those projects and what's currently happening um, around South Africa? Okay, Simon. Uh, so I think that's a bit of a challenge. That one. one to, You're the to Namibian answer. expert. Um, <laughs> test session myself for with research, and we are running a number of projects in Namibia on bottlenose and heavy side dolphins, and uh, the acoustic project on humpback dolphins that that we've talked about this evening. Uh, Gwen, Sasha, and Stephanie are all leading their own research groups, and there are a few other uh, researchers who, who aren't represented here tonight. Just the two of us. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. It looks like there was a few issues there, and it just all went down. But we are we are slowly coming back. So just stick with us, and um, hopefully the rest of the panel members will be back on shortly. And then we'll just pick up um, and and try to, <laughs> to get everybody going. <laughs> Sasha, you're back. <laughs> It's been so long. <laughs> oh, wow. Trying to live stream from Africa, hey? Yeah. Exciting. As as a mum, I want to get to the, the three or four questions posed by the children before bedtime. So that's my overriding uh, concern. I can see that there's children here that have posted questions. And so we're going to try and get to those before, before that all uh, encroaching bedtime arrives. Cool. Let's, let's kick it off and wait for everyone else to the other guys to refresh their browsers. So um, we can we can tackle Maris's um, Maris Jacobs question with Morgan 12. So when the baby humpback dolphins are born, do they have the humps or does it come with growth? Brilliant question, Morgan. Wow. First of all, I think I think to say that um, it's very, very rare to see um, I don't think anybody's actually filmed, and Steph, you might correct me if I'm wrong. Has anybody filmed a, a humpback dolphin giving birth? Not that um, I'm aware of, no. Yeah, so, so that's pretty, pretty rare. Um, but they do come with their humps, but they're often a bit more floppy, aren't they, Stephanie? I'm going to pass this one back to you. Well, when the babies are first, all dolphin babies are born, the, the fins and the, and the are folded over to one side. Um, and it takes a few days um, for these floppy fins to um, get hard and, and more erect. Um, 
with the humpback dolphins, as Taz just said, there there hasn't been any footage and we have very few strandings, so it's a bit hard to tell, but we actually don't consider the hump the fin. There is a little fin on top of the hump, so it's probably most likely that that little fin is folded over when the baby gets born and then with time becomes more erect, but the hump is definitely there um, and the fin will then sort of lift up and it'll all grow over time into a bigger hump and a bigger fin. Cool. Any more questions from the, the kids, Courtney, that you can pop through to us? Um, so Nakiso10 asks, how many dolphins are there in a pod? Do they each have a unique sound? These questions are awesome from these uh, from these kids. They're not my children. I've been prompting Lucas's friends at school to ask all questions. <laughs> Tess, how many are in a pod? Okie dokes. Well, I mean, the sizes vary. So sometimes you just find one or two uh, together and, and you don't find the, find the rest of the pod. But um, in general, um, up to 20 or 30 uh, for humpback dolphins, they, they tend to hang out in quite small groups. And uh, the society is what we call a fish and fusion society. So basically, um, the groups come together and then they split off again. Uh, we know from other dolphin species that uh, they do have long lasting sort of friendships or relationships with each other. So um, you can find animals uh, together more often um, and particularly as well with the, the mums and the calves, um, they'll, stay, they'll stay together and very closely associated for several years. Um, and in terms of the sounds, um, in bottlenose dolphins, we know that um, in the first uh, few months of life, the, the dolphins uh, learn um, an individually distinct call type, so a bit like a name in human society, and then they'll use that call uh, throughout, throughout their lives, um, and that, that call stays very stable, and that's the signature whistle that we're talking about in, in the film. If Courtney's up for it, she can throw up a picture of two signature whistles that were recorded 10 years apart. Um, but in general, uh, you know, what, what we know about signature whistles is, is based on bottlenose dolphins um, that are often the dolphins we see in captivity and also dolphins that, you know, the species that we see very close to shore. Um, humpback dolphins, we know much less about. Um, okay, so here, here's an example. You can't, you can't play the sounds here, but here you can see um, on the right and the left, there's two examples um, of, of whistles from dolphins, and each of those was, was recorded 10 years apart. So I hope you can see here um, that the, the whistles are very uh, stereotyped and very similar over, over that time period of 10 years. Um, and then... Yeah, we're, we're interested in whether or not humpback dolphins uh, use these signature whistles. Um, and, and so we're starting work on that now. And that's some of the first um, results that will be um, part of Sasha's PhD uh, research. Um, and we think we've found good evidence that they, they do use these stereotype calls, but we've got, we've got a bit more work to do to really look into it in more detail. So Tracy has a message from Luke, who's eight, saying, how fast can they go and what preys on them? So how fast can the dolphins go? That's the first part of that question. Shannon, are you itching to, do you know, <laughs> of that intake of breath? Yeah, they, they don't go very fast. They're not like bottlenose dolphins and common dolphins. They go quite slowly and um, they don't bow ride like the other species do. It's, I kind of think of them like they're like orangutans and the bottlenose dolphins are more like chimpanzees where they're in small groups and they go slowly and they do their own thing compared to bottlenose dolphins like the chimpanzees which are in big groups and excitable and rush around and everything. So I think of them like that um, in terms of speed and what preys on them while well, the big sharks do and we know from research that was done in the 80s that humpback dolphins actually have a quite a high incidence of shark scars on them, scars from being attacked by, by sharks, um, more than the bottlenose dolphins. Um, the Cocroft did a, a study looking at the different species that were caught in the nets and almost a third of humpback dolphins, more than a quarter, had, had scars. Um, it's entirely likely because they seem to 
um, especially in KZN, live more in, in murky water where it's hard to see what's coming at you. And also, again, the small group size maybe does make them a little more vulnerable to predators compared to the bigger groups of bottlenose dolphins that are a little bit safer. So that's how I'd answer that question. Um, have we got any more kids' questions before we head to... Okay, cool. So Jennifer Moore. No, it's cool, Courtney. <laughs> you can bring that one over. Um, is there knowledge of the behaviour associated with different types of vocalisations? And could we use this to help know what the dolphins are using different areas for? So I think this leads into some of the work that we've been doing, Tess. Yeah, so, so it, it, you know, in general... Um, there's a fair bit of information on sort of general dolphin species and li linking that to particular behaviors. So we know that signature whistles are contact calls and they're used uh, particularly when animals are out of visual contact and they want to, they want to either rejoin or just, or just uh, keep together in, you know, in the environment and, and keep in contact with each other. Um, in terms of the humpback dolphins, uh, one thing that I thought was really interesting is in some of our, uh, some of our recordings so far, um, we've got whistles that are, are fairly, you know, uh, mid-frequency is what we would call them. So humans can hear them. They're sort of less than 20 kilohertz um, and, and in our sort of hearing range. Um, and, that, uh, and that's the, the whistles that also fall into this category, which might be the, the signature whistle, so similar to, to a name. But occasionally, these guys go super, super high pitched. And so we're getting um, incredibly um, ultrasonic whistles from uh, these dolphins as well, um, just sort of on the odd occasion. And when we've looked back at our behavioral notes, um, it's, it, it seems to be when animals are very social and perhaps even mating. Um, and so from our side, that's quite an interesting observation for the humpback dolphins. So most of the time, they, they, they're, they're whistling in the audible range and then occasionally going very ultrasonic. And that's something that we're really interested to sort of delve into in more detail. Um, and then, you know, with other sounds that the, the dolphins make, um, uh, they'll make echolocation clicks, which are used to effectively to see the world. So used in, in foraging and to find fish. Um, and then also um, something called a burst pulse, which is effectively um, a very um, fast uh, call that's made uh, similar to, to the echolocation clicks. But the calls are so close together that actually it sounds like a squeaky, squeaky sound. And we think that that is, again, used in, in socializing and, and perhaps even foraging as well. So there's, there's different call types that you can link to, to certain behaviors. Um, and in, in sort of... Um, in controlled situations, you can also conduct something called a playback experiment to test out theories and ideas about what different sounds sounds are used for. Um, do we have a few more questions before we wrap up for this evening, I think, as we're heading towards eight? So Judith is asking, is it possible to develop an ecotourism product out of the, this research? For example, habituate them to restrict their movement and have a snorkel with a dolphins type expedition? So I think this uh, is up your alley, Gwen. You've done a lot of work with boat-based whale-watching tour operators. Um, so did you want to have a little uh, tackle that one? Yeah, sure. Thanks for the question. Um, just to start, it is, um, it's illegal to swim with uh, marine mammals in South Africa. It's not something that's encouraged as an ecotourism um, activity, um, both for the dolphin safety and for the human safety. We have quite a wild coastline, as you will have seen in the video. Um, but also, we have to remember that dolphins are top predators and um, they're also very sensitive to disturbance. So we don't encourage swimming with them um, in, in our coastal waters and it's something that's not um, permitted by government. So in terms of, um, on the screen here, um, I've been working uh, with a team here in Plate on a sustainable marine tourism project. And the aim is to try and understand if the regulations in our, in our whale watching industry um, are working to protect the animals. Um, we have actually got really good strict um, permit regulations in South Africa. So um, we're sort of having a look at, at what effect vessels um, have on, on dolphin behavior, and that's all vessels, not just the permitted um, industry. So this poster was developed by one of our team members, Caitlin Judge, um, 
and it uh, highlights some of the the biology of the humpback dolphins, but also gives um, some guidelines on on what you're allowed to do and what you're not not allowed to do as a, a permitted whale watching operator. And these these posters are f um, downloadable from the Nature's Valley Trust website under their resources page. Um, but yeah, so developing resources um, to educate people who use the ocean on boats or kayaks, um, anything really, um, is really critical to, to help us um, protect these, these endangered dolphins. Um, and there are recreational guidelines available too. And that, you know, if we think about their distribution, I don't know if, um, Courtney, you can get the distribution map up for the humpback dolphins but they're restricted to waters less than 25 meters deep and they have a really really narrow strip of coastline that they live in they've got nowhere else to go so we really need to um, make sure that 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 shallow coastline and shallow habitat that they live in is um, protected as much as possible and and boaters need to be careful of and reduce their speed when they're traveling close in shore um, yeah, so in terms of ecotourism, no swimming allowed. Um, it's not possible to habituate the dolphins. They're free-ranging wild animals, um, and they need to stay that way. So, um, yeah, we're going to have to come up with some, some better management plans uh, than trying to train them to stay away from people. <laughs> and then I think... Uh, then I think uh, Oh, I'm echoing now. Uh, a final question, maybe for our panel, um, as we approach eight o'clock, I think um, we can uh, to wrap up with one last question for everyone here. So Annabelle Dines says, loved it. Is there anything the general public can do to help the conservation of humpback dolphins? What an appropriate question to end on, everyone. Um, so has anybody got any initial thoughts um, from the panel on how they feel the public can really get involved with the uh, humpback dolphin conservation in South Africa. Go, Tess. They all got standing silence. Where do we, where do we start? Frozen. So, many, so many things, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there, there's loads of things. I know that Shannon had a few points to make, but I think she's, uh, she's uh, frozen there as well. Um, so, so Sasha, I mean, I think f f from our side as, as a group, one of, one of the ideas behind these kinds of question and answer sessions is to really raise the profile of the humpback dolphin. So I think in terms of uh, what the general public can do, it's really, really great for people to, to know that uh, in South Africa, we have very few humpback dolphins, that they are uh, locally endangered. Um, they're often very coastal and so this is where you know you might find them so if people are interested in, in sort of uh, land-based watching of, of dolphins um, then then they can actually that's right they can they can log a sighting um, through an app called the Seafari app which is shown here and actually that is one way that uh, members of the public can really help because they can get involved by providing this information on where where and when humpback dolphins are are seen um, and that's really useful uh, information that then converts into science later down the line and this Seafari app has been put together by um, Alex Vogel um, and it's really it, it, it useful it's free to 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 download and it provides useful information on where where these dolphins are which is actually quite difficult to get often because they're so coastal um, and they're often in these quite small groups um, it means that collecting information on on the humpback dolphins is actually quite tricky um, and so uh, everybody's sort of getting involved from the citizen science perspective and, and logging their sightings can be very useful um, in terms of other conservation actions, you know, there are, uh, you know, marine protected areas is one action, um, you know, removing shark nets or thinking about that is another action um, on a you know, larger scale, things like ocean noise are concerns or uh, climate change we discussed and also pollution from, from rivers. And so there's a whole different um, 
array of threats to the humpback dolphin. And that means that there's a lot of different potential conservation actions uh, that, can be, that can be implemented. Um, and it's something that as a consortium, we really struggle with as to which is the, the main sort of action and the main sort of, um, well, the main threats and the main actions that, that, that could be implemented. And so one of our sort of key objectives is really to, to raise the profile and to put humpback dolphins on the on the menu, I was going to say, but that's not what I mean. But on the on the table at these at these policy uh, meetings, and um, in terms of in terms of getting people involved and knowing um, at, the, at the government and intergovernment levels um, about humpback dolphins and 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 making sure that they don't become uh, further reduced in numbers and, and become locally extinct. Um, so it's 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 a bit of everything really. But um, I'm going to pass it across to, <laughs> to maybe to Gwen or to Stephanie who can add to that. Is Shannon back? No, Shannon's not back. Hey, she is. She's thinking. She's back. Can we hear you? <laughs> you had some points to say on to that, on that, um, Shannon. Yeah. Did I miss? I missed the. Did you have any points about uh, conservation? What how was people the, can was help? About what people can do? Yeah. Yes, it was. I think Tess and people covered a little bit, but what can? What do you yes. want to add to that? Yes, one. Well, I would say one thing that you could do is ordinary people can just make sure to buy locally instead of buying things that are shipped. Oh, no, we lost her again. Lost Shame. Her again. Okay, so. Uh, bad connection. Uh, yeah, yeah, bad connection. So I think, I think we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up there, though, for everyone. Um, and as we do finish, I just want to take this opportunity to say, say thank you for everyone for tuning in tonight um, and also for all of you guys on the panel and to um, to Shannon and Simon as well who didn't weren't able to log back in but I really appreciate you guys taking the time um, out of your evening to come and join me tonight for this for this event and especially to everyone back at home for tuning in and sticking with us through the technical difficulties I think we might have broken the site a couple of times <laughs> and struggled with bad internet connection but we've made it through we finished and I really appreciate everyone who has stuck with us to the end. And um, also I think we need to say a big, big thank you to Courtney, who is behind the scenes right now, um, who is probably a little bit stressed about with everything breaking on her. <laughs> but yeah, well, really, Courtney. really, really appreciate you, Courtney, for um, for posting the questions and uh, helping, uh, helping us on the back end. Um, and I really um, hope you've all enjoyed it and um, learned more about humpback dolphin conservation over the course of this evening. Um, so if you do want to find out more, you can head to the csearch.co.za website or the susaconsortium.com um, for more information. You can also subscribe to this channel, the Sea Search um, Research YouTube channel, where we're posting lots and lots of updates on the project as we go forwards with it um, over the coming months. And also this um, Q&A and the film will also be going live um, in the coming, I think the film will be going up live later today and the Q&A hopefully up tomorrow. So thank you ever so much for joining us, guys. Um, and yeah, and as for that, thank you. Well done, thank Tessa. You. Lovely video, everyone. Bye. <laughs>